collection of people than people who sat through this entire mini-conf um, talking about security uh, and we had important things to say about it as well. So um, I would like to start off with what I think is one of the most pressing questions of the day, and that is module stacking. Yeah. Okay, the question is yay, nay, and why? So I'll start off with my opinion, because otherwise I get to do my opinion last, and everybody knows that whoever's last is the one that's remembered, and I'll save that for the question I really want to answer last. Um, I say that what we need is, an LS, is a module that is a, stack, a stacker module that you can use to register other modules with, but I don't think that the, L, the base LSM itself should be, needs to be stackable. Um, if you have a module which is a stacker, then you can have uh, reasonable rational rules and the person who's maintaining that module can set them without setting oh, Linus, Alviro, um, people like that uh, on edge. So Russell. I think that when we get to the stage of having uh, the majority of the Linux uh, user base running with uh, an LSM module does something non-trivial, then we can talk about whether it's worthwhile having two modules. But uh, given that uh, we have such a large portion of the, the uh, user base refusing to use any of the LSM modules or anything remotely similar because they think it's too hard, uh, I think that's where the, the problem is. And uh, making it uh, exponentially harder by having uh, more than one module uh, it just really is not a viable option at this stage. Well, th this subject comes up every few months. Uh, so it gets discussed and um, <clears throat> it, there was a kernel summit a few years back where there was a discussion on the issue and it was basically decided at the time to not support uh, module stacking. I don't think there's any, been any really new kind of arguments since then. There's some discussion going on now which might shed new light on, on, the, on the discussion. So it would really, yeah, it's like, as Russell said, you, you really need to establish there's a, really a need there um, for it. There's all kinds of technical issues that, that come up. So they, um, even with the LSM stacker, you still have to um, mediate who has access to these um, security fields, uh, security blobs that are passed around. Uh, this kind of thing. So I mean, there's, there's people are always going to be able to come up with solutions, I guess. So um, if you know, if if a good argument can be made for it, then um, I guess it could be revisited with you know with the upstream um, folk. The there's some problems like it's been sort of shown in the in the security literature that. If you, there's, it's called the um, composability problem. So if you just take two security systems and join them onto each other, um, you can have consequences, security consequences, which you couldn't imagine um, beforehand. And no one's, um, there's, there's not a really great solution to this. In fact, that, that's one of the goals that's um, not well publicized that SE Linux um, attempts to solve. It actually has a module stacking system inside it. And that's why you've got um, type enforcement, role-based access control, multi-level security are actually all modules that basically stack inside SE Linux and there's a controlled coherent policy which allows you to control all of these different security models together. And that was, that was one of the original things that was pitched by the SE Linux developers which I think just uh, kind of went over everyone's head. But also partly because it wasn't being demonstrated and there's no good um, API for, for, for developing this kind of thing. So partly there is already support for this in and um, yeah I think I think you would need to to demonstrate something new. I mean why why would you want to run um, two LSMs? And I know you've got an answer your time based system but often you can then counter with an argument you know that you have time based access control where you could actually implement that as an additional component of SE Linux or Smack. Put the bullion and counter it in the killer process, yeah. So, I assume for the other LSM you want to use at the same time is that SE Linux. Yeah. So, but then again, we've had secondary stacking of capabilities. Um, so, it may be possible to do it. If something really compelling came along, it may be possible to do it in a similar way without having to build in a whole full 
um, stacking infrastructure. But um, I, I would imagine you would need you would, it would be more difficult to get the stacking uh, consensus on the stacking than it would be to get the path name security hooks in, which are actually in, and took quite a long time. So it's been quite a challenge. But yeah, if there's a good good argument, then it'll be considered. Uh, I would say yay um, for the reason that my argument would be that if you don't have stacking, you just get a whole lot of different people putting hooks in different places in the kernel. So for example, people want a personal firewall. Okay, so that's not good enough to be a LSM in its own right, so okay, we'll just write that into the kernel. Um, someone wants to have an discretionary control over controlling their own applications. So OK, so we'll write a separate one for that. Um, you, you know, you want a, a virus, antivirus, anti-malware. Uh, so they write a separate interface for that. And all of these things are basically different types of access control, where if you had a stackable infrastructure, they could all use the same interface. Um, and you get a neater solution. something. <coughs> One of the goals of LSM, or one of the sort of agreed things, is that it's um, purely for access control, or hopefully it's purely for access control. So when people came along wanting to put in uh, integrity measurement and integrity control, uh, we asked them to put in a different set of hooks because they wanted to piggyback on the LSM hooks. Um, so there's some integrity stuff. And then similarly with the uh, anti-malware, um, there's going to be separate hooks for malware. So it's not necessarily true that if you have anti-malware that it belongs in LSM and um, if it's significantly different then there, there may be a case for a different, uh, you know, because the, the, it only needs a subset of the hooks and mm. some in different places, so, um, okay. Say for example you wanted to, uh, to have a mandatory controller which was very strong, like SE Linux to um, for an administrator to set up, so say they feel very secure about the system, but then a user themselves want to come along and confine one program that they're running um, with their own policy, and they don't have access to change SE Linux's policies, then if you had a separate uh, module that could stack in there with it, they could use that and not upset anything for anyone else. And Uh, as Tetsu mentioned, uh, LSM stack uh, uh, seems to me at preferable. And in, of course, uh, for Tomoyo, uh, Tomoyo and SA Linux want to uh, Tomoyo wants to coexist with SA Linux, so LSM stack is preferable. And as a point of uh, divergence view. Uh, there are a few, only a few Mac modules exist. Uh, so uh, I think uh, from my personal point of view, uh, many Mac module is needed, uh, uh, many Mac module will be needed to, um, to implement stackable LSM. So can you get a question from the audience here? I, okay, I asked him for a hard question earlier. I don't know if it's a hard question, but you mentioned that we really needed to get people using one security module before we have um, we start thinking about adding more of them. You know, I help a group that maintains their own little hosted server, and they they put CentOS on it, and s soon enough they had trouble with their websites running into stuff with SE Linux, and so they just turned it off. Um, and I think that's a pretty common response still is to just say, screw it, I can't, I don't have time for this. What are we going to do to get to the point where people are actually running a security module and, um, and all this technology is available to them? I'll start that one too. Okay. Um, it is in some ways unfortunate that the first security module that was present in the kernel was probably one that approaches the maximum capabilities of the LSM. Um, it's difficult to think of a security module that would be more sophisticated than SE Linux that would be viable in yeah, at any in any way. Um, 
And this is a design feature of, of SE Linux. SE Linux is designed to be a complete security solution to your access control needs. Uh, a lot of people don't need that much weight and certainly don't want to deal with that much complexity. So, um, yeah, I'm of the opinion that, that a, a number of small modules would be a much better way to get, gain acceptance than you know, the one large one. Which is one of, you know, brings me back to my stacking position. Uh, if you have two modules that do little things and that won't interfere with each other, put them both in. Um, that would be really nice. That would probably be really spiffy. Uh, people would probably like that. Um, SC Linux comes from a school of design which yeah, is monolithic and assumes that you really, really, really want to do that level of access control. And I don't think that that's true of modern computing environments in general. Okay, first I think we should uh, take a step back and just look at the, the, um, uh, the history of, of uh, Unix security. Uh, about, uh, about 10 years ago or so, uh, it was expected that uh, pretty much every daemon on a system would run as root. And uh, uh, root was used widely where, where it wasn't needed. And uh, it's, it's been recent, uh, also a steady trend to run increasing numbers of daemons as non-root and uh, also to uh, decrease, decrease the privileges where they're optional. So uh, it used to be also uh, not uncommon to have a web servers uh, like Apache running as root. You can configure it to run as root, uh, and it makes some things easier because uh, Apache can then read all the files in the system. And Apache has own configuration to say which directories it should be saving files from and not. And as long as you trust Apache to not be buggy, then uh, everything's cool, right? And so uh, this sort of attitude was uh, uh, taken right throughout uh, all aspects of Unix systems. And so it's been a steady process of, of education and uh, software development. Education for users that, you know, really doing things as root isn't the right way to do it. And one, one of the many examples of this is the, the recent trend towards uh, banning people from uh, logging on to IRC channels as, as root. Uh, in the early days of running my things Play Machine, I would uh, run an IRC client from that as root and log into IRC channels basically to uh, troll people. And I still no, it's okay, I'm running it as a user run score C domain. So it's okay, I'm not going to get compromised. No way from to keep me off the channel. So uh, it's been a sort of ongoing process of educating users about uh, the different issues. And uh, I think the same thing will happen with, with SE Linux. I mean, now people are saying, oh no, it's too hard. Just like they used to say, it's too hard to run a daemon as non-root. But then they sort of realize actually it's not too hard. And, and the, the standards that are expected from uh, programs and administrators have uh, in increased. I think we'll happen with SE Linux and also with some of the other uh, competing modules as well. So we'll get more traction in the marketplace and we'll get more use. But it's a, a process that takes time. James? Um, yeah, I guess I, I think Russell's right in that um, it takes time to get people to adjust to different types of security. And when I first started using Linux, there was no SSH. And everyone was just freely using the R commands and Telnet. and um, it took quite a long time for people to actually really fully switch over. And I think you'll find that, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that most NFS deployments are done without uh, any kind of encryption on the wire. And if you can imagine, people are mounting their home directories over NFS and what's in their home directories, private keys, all kinds of stuff. And people still are not using um, mechanisms that are there. You can run um, encrypted NFS if you really want to. So there's there's always a cost of security and there's always a, a long period of time before people start adopting it. Uh, it's certainly if you go to like or you follow hacker conferences you'll see huge numbers of banks with really um, trivially incorrect security on their, their web, their logins. I was in, uh, when I was at Foss.in, the guy who gave a keynote, a photographer, a Linux hobbyist and he um, showed some really amazing uh, things that he'd found just on some websites, just while he was preparing his slides, just um, cross-site scripting and um, session stealing and so on. So security is really difficult. And to to say, well, is is when is everyone going to start using uh, an LSM? I, I actually don't know if that's actually a um, a reasonable kind of expectation that everyone's going to have it switched on and 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 using it. There's some people who, some types of power users who are always going to switch off security. There are, I think someone asked a bunch of kernel hackers if what 
uh, whether they use firewalls and so on on their own systems, and I think this included people like Ted and, and Andrew Morton, various people. And I think I don't think anybody had uh, a firewall on their their, their laptop uh, enabled. Um, and most of most of the or so, uh, quite a few of the kernel hackers I know build their own kernels and co compile out every almost every security feature except for um, UIDs. Can we have a show of hands in the audience? Uh, who here has a, net, net, uh, a firewall, such as like, say, a, net, a net field configuration on the laptop they're using right now, predicting the conference network? So you, these ones you have the, the firewall. Okay. Yeah. So this right, this wouldn't have been the case, you know, a few years ago. I mean, people used to disable it, be, switch off the firewall, and because it would break their applications, and it's it's taken a long time to fix the bugs and also fix the usability. So it's a combination of that. And we've actually seen that in the SE Linux project that for a few years now they've been tracking how many people have got SE Linux enabled in Fedora, there's the Smalt system. And over the last couple of years it's it's been rising quite rapidly and it's it's it, it's a significant majority of users and, and we don't know exactly because it updates every month and every month like if 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 someone sends out a package that everyone uses and it's got a an SE Linux policy interaction vast numbers of people will just switch off SE Linux and the, the number goes down and then it goes back up again when people update. Um, so part of it is trying to stop those kinds of things from happening. Another thing was some of the developments like um, SE Alert which allowed users to actually see what was going on. Part of it also is educating people to run SE Linux in permissive mode rather than switching it off completely until the bug gets fixed and they can switch it back on because if you switch it off um, when you switch it back on again, um, you need to do a file system relabel, which takes forever. And so a lot of people switch it off and say, I'm never touching that. You means 10 minutes. Yeah, 10, 10 minutes is a long time for, for, for most people. Uh, and it can take longer, it could take 30 minutes. So if you go in permissive mode, it won't, uh, the labeling keeps working. So there's a lot of things there, improvements in usability, improvements in education, um, making the policies, um, work a lot better and, and make them more flexible. Uh, but you know, it's never, it's never going to be perfect and I, I don't think anyone's going to come up with a perfect solution. And you can, you can make um, simplified, a simplified thing on top of SE Linux, like a simplified layer. The Japanese project uh, SE Edit actually does that. It, it copies the, um, the AppArmor um, path name configuration format somewhat and compiles down to SE Linux policy. So it's technically po possible to have, and, and also to have learning mode and have flashy tools and so on. So I also I think to some extent that what SE Linux is doing is making sure that you can actually provide complete um, security mediation. So every, secu every security relevant interaction on the system can can be controlled if you need it to. Now that doesn't mean that you you need to and you need to understand the low-level policy and it's the low-level policy that unfortunately sort of everyone got exposed to initially uh, is maybe something like assembly language and um, at the moment in, in SE Linux we're just starting to get up to maybe um, higher level of abstractions and we're not say quite yet at a, a Python or a, a Ruby on Rails or something yet but maybe we're at a, a, a good version of C for, for, for people who want to use it so there's still there's still a lot to to, to a long way to go there um, and of course you know there are if you have a fundamentally simpler starting point um, you know you, you you might find success that way which is what Casey's been doing with smack and um, yeah, it, it, yeah, that can provide useful security as well. So, uh, I I don't know what exactly what the answer is <laughs> to your question, but just that yeah, it, it, people are working on it, and I I think that um, if you look over time, security's um, improving. Right, so it's a it's an incremental thing, and we every now and then get emails from people on the, uh, who say oh here's a log file, does this mean I was getting attacked? And quite often people have got SE Linux running on their system they don't actually know and it's a, um, there's a, been a, a, a Joomla, I think, a PHP attack, very, very commonly exploited all over the place and lots of people have been, um, SE Linux has been blocking a lot of those We're, and people don't even know it's there to switch it off. Um, and so if people are having problems, I'd really strongly suggest 
um, failing a bug if you're using Fedora, um, or possibly even CentOS fa fail a bug in the, um, the Bugzilla, Red Hat uh, Bugzilla, and I think you'll find people who, have, they might have had good reactions usually within 24 hours getting their, their bug fixed. Um, and yeah, of, of course the problem is a lot of people don't, don't want to jump over that barrier and, and don't see the value of the security. I think that you can't blame the users for not using the security and that maybe it's the security people's fault that it's too complicated. So if you want more people to use it, you have to make it more simple. So mainly why more people are using SE Linux now is because there are more high level tools and maybe the, the, the answer is to build security using high level abstractions that people can understand so that th when they use the security system, they feel they're getting the benefit out of the effort that it takes them to use it. So I'll just plug my own system. So, uh, <laughs> so for example, with uh, FBAC, we can, can create policies using high-level abstractions um, to make it easier for a user to understand what's actually happening. Uh, the important point, uh we, uh, especially including us, uh, Tomoyo people, the important point is uh, average user doesn't want to think of security. They want to use Linux uh, for their own reason. So they, their purpose is not security. So uh, security guys uh, should um, approach their purpose, uh, their own purpose, and the one of the answer, uh, our answer is Tomo Linux running mode, and as Linux people, uh, as they troubleshoot or permissive domain, such approach should be uh, continued uh, to achieve uh, users uh, can easily use security, uh, high security. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of buzzword introduction here. Um, cloud computing is the, the <laughs> I heard, heard at least one chuckle from the panel. Uh, cloud computing is the kind of the buzzword of the day. Uh, what are we going to do to make sure that Linux wins the cloud computing world from a security standpoint? And I'm going to start in the middle of the panel this time. So what's cloud computing? Amazon AC2. Uh, cloud computing is like grid computing, except you don't know them, own the servers on the other end. So, uh, what's Linux going to do to? Um, well, I think, I think if you look at a, you know Fedora or, or Ubuntu, a modern Linux distribution overall, yeah, the security capabilities are pretty much well unmatched by other general purpose operating systems. So, I think all the pieces are there, and you now with things like namespaces and. Um, you could, it's like a super version of uh, Chiroot. So you can, even without all these you know, mandatory access control schemes, there's a lot of DAC and a lot of features there, and we've got encryption. And interestingly, you know, 10 years ago, um, actually I came to Kalu, and Netfilter was like Netfilter 0 0.17 alpha or something at that point. And um, I don't know if OpenSSH was even you know, around. So in that time, you know, you can, you can Definitely say that uh, S that Linux has um, you know, developed a lot of security capabilities. So just from that, I think people who are deploying cloud architectures have have a lot to draw on there. Uh, in terms of specifically addressing this, uh, it's something that uh, we're that I've been looking at with uh, virtualization because often these are virtual appliances. And um, so in the the talk I'll be doing on Friday. Uh, I'll be talking about how uh, we can start applying mandatory access control to start uh, containing um, and confining um, virtual machines that are running. And it's, a, it's kind of a complex picture because there's no really standard definition of what, what the cloud is and, and things are, things are, de are developing really quickly. And it requires um, a sort of combination of a number of uh, solving a, a lot of quite difficult problems. So being able to identify um, your resources remotely uh, and securely, 
being able to protect uh, them, pr you know, protect the privacy so that where you're running your services, the, the operators can't necessarily get in and see what you're doing or, or modify it. Um, uh, being able to verify, you know, uh, integrity uh, verification and remote attestation, there's, there's quite a lot of difficult problems to solve there altogether. Um, and securing it while it's at rest, you know, in, um, in, with you know, cryptography and um, probably use of digital certificates and all kinds of things which have never quite worked properly. So, <laughs> yeah, how, how I, but I think Linux is definitely, you know, the, the, best, the best platform to, to try and start solving the problem, but uh, it's, it's one of these things that if there is a, if there is a, a breach, then it could be quite quite bad. I think uh, solving any problems, as, um, Linux does a pretty good job in that it's extendable. If someone can see that there's a solution, uh, they can imagine it, then they can have a go at coding it. Um, it's good because it's open, so researchers are like, uh, able to go in and try and um, extend it. Uh, if there was stacking, it would be even easier. Um, so yeah, it's, there's the infrastructure's there for anyone to try and solve the problem in unique ways. Um, unlike if someone came up with an idea to try and improve Microsoft's products, you basically need to be in-house in order to give it a try uh, in, in some cases, whereas with Linux, it, 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 lots of people can try and solve the problem. Uh, to be honest, uh, currently my main work is about cloud computing. So, uh, cloud, uh, in cloud computing, uh, Linux the role is very huge, huge, and it's especially uh, Amazon AWS using using uh, Zen as a platform, uh, and many Linux images is easily available uh, as a has. So, as a security point of view. Uh, it is difficult. Uh, crowd, crowd is uh, now uh, just a buzzword, so the definition is very crowdy. So <laughs> it is uh, difficult to answer. But uh, the uh, important point is not Linux, but uh, not to create a single point of fear. I think. You get to go last. Yeah, this way people will remember what you have to say. Okay. All right. Um, cloud computing reintroduces a paradigm that a lot of the operating system people have always dreaded, and that is cryptography. Uh, in the cloud computing, you want as much encrypted on, the, on your, your node as possible because it's off running at a, a web farm that you know, might be owned by Yahoo, it might be owned by Google, it might be owned by the government of Vietnam, it might be owned by who knows who, and your important information is there, um, and your only access to it is over the network, which again is going through at least three or four, you know, you know, potentially three or four foreign countries on two or three continents uh, to get between you and there because their rates are cheaper. And now it matters whether there's exposure to it because there may very well be environments that you're going through that are not friendly environments. And you know, in the grid computing world, you know, those were your computers on the other end, you could control the link. When it's just out there on the internet somewhere, uh, hopefully it's, you know, some of it's in Seattle, some of it's in um, Wenatchee, some of it's in Pango Pango. Uh, it matters now whether you've got your information encrypted or not. And you know, I have always been a mechanism person. I have always shied away from cryptography because that, that deals with real mathematics. And uh, real mathematics is hard. Let's go shopping. Um, so I think that one thing that we as, as security professionals need to start looking at again is cryptography because it's going to be bigger than ever. Okay, well, I, I think Casey chose me last because I've already blogged about uh, security in Amazon EC2. Uh, I was for, uh, 
impressed by some things they've done and uh, disappointed by others. Amazon have uh, written some documents about the way they've set up the Zen servers in a conceptual uh, basis, which are very good. And if you're uh, planning on setting up a Zen server, it's worth having a read of those for just information on what you can do. But in terms of actual uh, what they provide to the users of the service, uh, it's a vastly different story. And it's sort of you know back to like you know 94, 95 uh, quality of, of security. Uh, for example, uh, if you go to set up an EC2 instance, you, you see you have some uh, uh, sample instances from Amazon. And uh, let's start off with a, a Fedora Core 4 instance and a Fedora Core 6. I think the latest one, uh, the last one checked was Fedora Core 8, which at the time was about to due to uh, be, uh, expire from security updates. So uh, uh, more than two thirds of the instances they had available as samples were out of security updates, and uh, therefore uh, you would expect to have some security issues if you just did a deployment. And also, if you did a deployment of say Fedora Core 4 nowadays, uh, you would uh, presumably want some things to be installed that aren't, uh, aren't in the default install. To install those, and they haven't had security updates either, so you're getting more uh, unpatched software on there, and there's more issues. And uh, so I think that uh, the fact that I think that most users of any service will, to a large extent, uh, go for the defaults. And if the defaults are insecure, then uh, most of the users are insecure. So I think EC2 is just uh, ripe for botnet harvesting because of this. Uh, also, um, the, the kernel image that they, they supply. Uh, last time I checked this was a few months ago. They had a, a kernel image that was uh, produced in, I think, February 2008. So it was almost a, a year old uh, kernel image. So eight months old kernel image. And uh, for some situations, this might be sort of OK. I mean, if you're running you know, your own personal desktop at home uh, and you've got a, 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 a almost a year old kernel, sure, you've got some kernel security exploits. But uh, if, most the, if all the, the data that really matters is on your UID anyway, then uh, the attacker will do all damage they can, they can reasonably do before they crack the kernel. For a, a, a server running on EC2, you might have several different things running different UIDs. If one gets cracked, you want the other bit to get cracked. But if a kernel has no uh, good separation between UIDs because uh, it's an old kernel and it has a known kernel security flaw, then uh, you lose there. And um, uh, also, the, the process of upgrading kernels uh, was uh, some documents uh, of Amazon said that you could do this. Uh, none of them that I found told you how to do it. And some of them implied you couldn't do it. And so uh, I think that given that uh, I ran out of time to play with Amazon before I had to write my own kernel, uh, I think that the majority of people who use Amazon EC2 wouldn't use their own kernels and they'd be using the kernel Amazon supplied, which had known security flaws. And uh, I think that this is just a I think that Amazon is actually better than a large part of the industry in this regard. If you look at some of the, uh, the Zen virtual hosting uh, providers, uh, they have the same thing but worse. They have images that, you, uh, that are installed by default. They have uh, no policies in terms of upgrading kernels. I mean, if you're running you know, 1,000 or 10,000 servers and you want to be secure, you, you, it would make sense to have a policy saying, uh, we demand that you have a certain version of the kernel. And if we detect that you haven't upgraded a kernel within X period of time after the kernel update has, been, uh, has come out, then we'll do a, a forcible shutdown of the machine to reboot it and install a kernel in terms of service. This would be inconvenient for customers. But if you give them, say, a month's notice, they can manage that. And it would involve a measurable increase in the, in the overall security of the system. But I mean, no one does this sort of stuff. And um, uh, I think at all, all levels of the ISP hosting industry, there's just not real, no real attention to to security at all. Uh, I'm not aware of any ISP that has SE Linux uh, enabled in default configuration. And uh, this is a, a great disincentive for, for people to use it. Um, also, our attestation was mentioned before. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, my understanding of attestation is that uh, if the, uh, a hostile party has access to greater compute resources than uh, is being tested, then they can beat it. So as a case of, say, doing a, a hash of the uh, uh, FileSystem image, if uh, the attacker can store the entire original FileSystem image, unless you run the modified one, they can uh, uh, insert into that process and give the uh, correct uh, attestation key even though the, the uh, wrong data is being used. Uh, in terms of encryption, uh, I know that some people are using encryption of uh, block devices through the, the Amazon EC2 service, that is the uh, Elastic Block Store devices. Uh, I'm not convinced that does really much good. I mean, if Amazon themselves get compromised so that an attacker can uh, read a, a stationary uh, block uh, EBS volume without the, uh, the um, uh, EC2 instance being accessing it, then uh, encryption would, would help. But if, it, if an attacker can compromise the uh, EC2 instance, then they can get it all encrypted, decrypted because they've got the key for it. 
so well, I think that's, that, that's the, the main weak point, and that's the point where, where you'd lose. Uh, it's a matter of uh, really uh, money in this situation. I think if there's more money to go around, who would spend more money on hardware, more money on staff time, then some of these things will get solved. But at the moment, uh, money is in short supply, uh, and uh, people aren't really that concerned about security. They get lazy. So uh, this is the situation we live in. And uh, the real, I think the real uh, problem with this is that people in position like, say, uh, uh, me and some of my clients, um, would like to be able to spend a bit, bit of extra money to get better security. We don't want to spend 10 times the money because the money just isn't there. If there was like a, case, a case of paying twice the money, then it would be a good option. And if uh, uh, 100,000 other people pay twice the money, then you know, it would be a viable business model. But uh, there's no business model for having a small number of people paying twice the money for better security. And it's a financial problem that, uh, at this stage, uh, isn't really solvable. So did we have a question up there in the, the royal boxes? Oh, okay, Greg. Um, yes, we were talking about stackable LSMs earlier. All right, so, so just, I'm going to repeat this for the camera here. Um, so the problem you've, run in, you've encountered with NFS v4 is that since the LSM is, is, is a restrictive model, that doesn't fit well with the um, POSIX ACL model. Well, uh, in fact, you can't implement POSIX ACLs using the LSM. So the, the question is, why would you do a lesser module when SE Linux is there? An authoritative option. Yeah, so, so if you had a stackable, you'd like to have an, an authoritative option. Ah, well, it's nice to know that the SGI people are here. <laughs> um, so I'll start off and I'll, I'll, I'll talk, talk my viewpoint on it and these, the rest of the panel here can shoot me down. Um, when the LSM was originally proposed back in, what year was that, 98? 2001? Gosh. I thought time flew faster than that. So in, in 2001... Uh, okay. Uh, well, you say the implementation. The original implementation that was proposed came from SGI. Um, and it was an authoritative model. And it was declined on a number of reasons. Um, the first one was that it was too large, it had too many hooks. Now it has about half the number of hooks that are there currently. Um, but the real, the real vocal objection was that you would be able to use it to circumvent the kernel um, policies and you could use it to implement things out of, you know, out of tree. So if you wanted to implement something like Tivoli, um, a backup and restore system, uh, as a binary, binary add-on that was outside of the GPL, there was nothing to prevent you from doing it. Um, and that was, a, you know, that was a major objection. And because of that, um, and a number of other uh, lesser issues, uh, the, the majority of the people who were interested in LSM at the time felt that a restrictive model would be significantly more likely to be accepted 
than an authoritative one. And that, that argument carried the day. Um, I still believe that an authoritative model would be better. I have seen implementations of facilities that abuse the current LSM in exactly the way the people were afraid an authoritative LSM would be abused. Uh, so I don't think that anybody, you know, I don't think that the choice addressed to that issue. Um, would I recommend changing it at this point? I think that that would be a really, really, really big deal. I think that um, an adaptation of the capabilities mechanism to support an authoritative mechanism could very well be done in a more acceptable way, although um, the last time I looked into doing that, it turned out it was really hard and um, all kinds of things fell down around me, so I didn't do a good job on, on the research on that. So it could be done. We could change to doing that. Um, I think we should have done it that way from the start. I understand the reasons why we don't have that today. And I don't think that most of the people who were strong advocates of the restrictive again, as opposed to authoritative have changed their mind. But we'll let somebody else have their say on the, on the issue. OK. Um. <laughs> An issue that often comes up, as I think I mentioned before, is that um, uh, you run tell people about AC Linux who haven't heard about it before. They say, but what if someone misconfigures AC Linux and it grants inappropriate privileges and makes the machine you know, wide open uh, for inappropriate access? And my response is, well, AC Linux is based on LSM, which is a restrictive model, and uh, it doesn't support that. And I go, okay, that's okay then. I'm not so scared of it. And I think this is a significant factor. And uh, maybe at some future time when, uh, you know, uh, when we get uh, the majority of the market using AC Linux or, or similar uh, LSM modules, uh, and there's less uh, irrational fear about these things, then we could possibly have an option of saying, well, maybe we have two types of LSM modules, restrictive and authoritative, and uh, work things out like that. But I think, I think at this stage, I mean, the, there's no practicality of changing things, and uh, the benefit of, of reassurance of people who, who are just uh, you know, scared of cold water uh, is a, a, a factor that's worth noting. Okay. No, I don't think I have anything to add. I think Casey covered the historical um, background. There was a lot of discussion about in, on the LSM list initially about what would be acceptable to the mainstream, mainline kernel people. You've got to remember this is a different era. This is when um, you know you didn't. We didn't have. We didn't. You didn't get things into the kernel very easily. It's Thing, the, the culture's changed. Um, you can get things in much more easily now. But the idea of, of getting anything at all in, in for this security system was, was touch and go. Quite a lot of the networking hooks actually got rejected by the networking maintainers. Um, so, yeah, that was part of that initial decision. But if you also think in terms of these access control models, imagine if you could go into IP tables and type a command that actually gave you more access than you already had uh, through the normal socket interfaces, right? If it could somehow override the, and this is this is one of the things that, as Russell said, if, uh, use privilege, if anybody could get privilege ports, or anybody could, and, but if you could, could ac socket. almost accidentally do it through IP tables, if, imagine if IP tables could make you less secure because you typed a command wrong, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing you have to have to consider, and, and it's not it's not black or white. I think if someone comes along and says, look, I've got this really great idea and they, they look at the earlier discussions and make sure they're not going over the same discussions again and present something new, I think. Or restate something maybe that wasn't understood. Um, but yeah, I, th I, I don't think anything's ever closed off. I think it's a matter of uh, convincing people. Um, the, the point you know when to stop is when uh, Linus, is, Linus calls you crazy. Then he's um, about to consign you to the, uh, to the ID, crazy ID maintainer or crazy riser of S maintain a bucket, so. Uh, I'll answer your first question. Um, I don't think that not SE Linux equals less than SE Linux. Um, the SE Linux is uh, excellent at what it does, and it fits, um, does it 
meets its security goals well, but different people have different goals. Um, and there are people that can see, criticise aspects of SE Linux and try and to address them by proposing alternative uh, Linux security modules. Uh, I'm not clear about uh, that. Uh, we should uh, review uh, what LSM is for. So, currently, uh, this L current LSM implementation is mainly for SE Linux. So, we should uh, uh, we should now uh, review the LSM's role. So, we have time for another question. Uh, you again. So, so the question, the, the comment was that um, if you think that the LSM is only for SE Linux, then you've pretty well limited yourself to the LSM only being for SE Linux. Uh, you had a comment? Yeah, it, uh, LSM is sort of SE Linux shaped um, because it was the most yeah. complex uh, system, but it, you know, it was based around. Most yeah, most. The one that was funded. There, there have actually been uh, LSMs that have gone into the tree, into the mainline tree, and actually been found to be insecure uh, and unfixable and gone out again. It was the um, BSD jail LSM got rejected. Uh, so there, there have been, there are other LSMs, but I mean, I don't think this is really the case that, that um, people are saying it has to be SE Linux based. There's uh, a set of path name hooks went into LSM in the last kernel, which are developed based around the, these are basically App Armor and Tomoyo shaped hooks. So uh, it's not, you know, I don't think anyone's really thinking like that. It just happens to be uh, the way things have gone historically. Ha ha ha. Um, and to just add a little bit of credence to that, it's perfectly rational that the LSM looks like an, an SE Linux facility because it was the only one that, was, that had anything going into it for years. Um, but now, um, the bulk of the work that went into the, the labeled networking code over the last uh, release cycle was for SMAC. So um, it is certainly the, and again, the LSM changes that have gone in have been for the, the name-based systems. So although LSM looks like an interface for SE Linux today, I think that we're going to see it diverging. And we've already seen one case where the SE Linux uh, developers saw something that went in for another LSM and said, oh, we can use that. Um, cap, well, cap Mac override. Um, so I, uh, you had a. Uh, one one uh, comment that's been made on many, many occasions uh, by uh, developers of some other uh, security projects um, is that they say, oh, uh, we can't use the LSM for our project because the LSM doesn't have all the hooks we need. And the response from people involved in the LSM development is, well, you know, submit a patch, adding the extra hooks, and uh, make it a good patch, and it can be considered and hopefully uh, incorporated. And, uh, but, you know, they haven't chosen to do so, and those hooks haven't been there. It's just a matter of you know, which projects have the people who actually go to the effort of writing the, the, the LSM hooks, uh, submitting them, probably having them uh, rejected the first pass, uh, rewriting them to make them better, submitting them again, and then eventually getting them through. It's a, a fair bit of work, but the result means that you know, your, your uh, LSM module, uh, security module, will then work in the standard kernel without uh, much effort and can eventually be a, a candidate for inclusion in the kernel, whereas some people just haven't chosen to do so. Uh, anybody else? Yes. A basic beginner's question. All right. I'll let it not running. Uh, you're saying the machine shouldn't boot up. Well, that's an interesting comment that I haven't heard anyone make before. Um, well, one, one uh, thing, of course, is that, uh, okay, just if we had a hypothetical machine that wouldn't connect to the internet after uh, it had run past expiry, 
and so therefore you couldn't update it to, to uh, get the new kernel out and expired because uh, you, you disconnected. So that's obviously one, one problem. Uh, also, uh, anything that results in machines just telling stopping working is not going to be well accepted at all. And uh, there are also uh, internal environments. I mean, if you've got a machine on your own desktop at home, not connected to the internet, uh, why shouldn't it keep working? Um, well, <laughs> I'll tell you where the harm is. Guess what kernel version runs on Cisco routers? Oh, that would be bad. <laughs> 2.4 and a single digit. Yeah, 2.4.9. Thereabouts. Yeah, typically. Okay, so. Um, I, I think you're going to see here that your embedded systems, the ones that don't change, are going to have an awful lot of trouble if they're going to expire. Um, uh, well, except that that is the internet. <laughs> the internet is made up of expired systems. And this, by the way, is not unique to Linux. All right? Um, the, the vast majority of systems that are being installed today with Windows on them, okay, are using Windows 2003. Okay? There, there's a significant um, business model in, back in uh, downgrading your systems from Vista to XP, uh, simply because people have found enough problems with the updated environments. Their environments don't work, so they want the old thing. They want the old reliable thing. And yeah, if, if kernels expired, I'm sorry, but the internet would be dead tomorrow. Yes. Uh, I think it's actually uh, a job for ISPs to disconnect the people who've got uh, old infected machines, and a job for governments to, to make some uh, legislation uh, uh, encouraging or forcing them to do so. The other thing that touches, uh, if your machine's found to be having a botnet, you get a $100 fine and disconnection from the internet until you fix it. That, I think that would do the job. I guess you could try writing a um, some sort of package for a distribution, and see if they would accept it as a as an optional thing for sysadmins to set it to start warning. You know, because um, mo most distros publish the dates that they're going to um, stop providing updates and start giving warnings, and then possibly um, just not bring up an e Ethernet interface or something if if it's really that important. The latest is the release of two versions plus, like uh, Oracle Core 10, uh, making for Oracle 8 can be expired. I don't know, if you can get it into a distribution, this this thing, and make it make it optional, um, I don't know how exactly how it would work, but yeah, that's that's a real problem. I, I, I used to when I used to do um, some sysadmin work, I, it was exactly the same situation back in you know when I was doing that last century. Um, you'd you'd Someone would say, can you come and fix this machine? It's running, our server's running really slowly. The email form doesn't work and the whole disk is full and it's been um, used as a, a, a spam generator and, and the log files, the mail log files have filled up the disk. Um, yeah. Whoever comes up with a good solution for that will probably be highly appreciated. Yeah, I don't know. I think this is another usability problem. Uh, sorry to sound like a broken record, but I guess the best way to have people running an up-to-date system is to make it easy for them to do so um, and that most distributions will include automatic update systems and if they choose to turn that off um, it's pretty hard to just say well you're not allowed to be on the internet anymore. I have no idea about it but uh, update is an important factor for security. So I think we, we can do one more, if anybody has one. OK, you in the middle. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was just wondering what you guys think about the, um, uh, sorry, phrasing loss. Ah, yes. The, the damage done, particularly in larger networks, by what I'm going to call security in the public, and the fact that things like people's security tends to be done Security policy particularly being done a lot more in gut feeling than actual studies. Password rotation being an example of that, where someone did a study and found that for best password rotation you had 
Okay. Okay. So uh, I'll start off with this one. This is a fun one. Security mythology is is the is the topic, and what do we do about it? And I'm going to contradict myself. I love it when I get to get a chance to do this, because earlier I, I just uh, extolled the virtues of cryptography. Uh, there, were, there was a 20-year period where everybody in computers knew that security meant cryptography, and that cryptography meant security, and that they were synonymous, and there was nothing else to be said. I mean, everybody knows that what you mean when you say security is cryptography, because that's what it is, isn't it? Um, yeah, the myth mythologies of you know password rotation, um, careful group selection, uh, keeping your system up to date with the latest patches, keeping your system at the old safe version, uh, keeping your your system in line with the corporate guidelines, making sure that your system is unique so it isn't hackable like the other ones are. Um, these are all myths. None of them work, um, and. I don't think that there's a way to address it because it's a people problem. And it's like if you're driving down the road and there's a car ahead of you and it's, you know, smoke is billowing out the back, um, what are you going to do? You know, it's, it, okay, it's a people problem. Okay? And so long as we continue to deal with people, it's going to be there. And we can provide technologies that make your computer safer in the presence of people. But there's only so far we can go. And you know, we, we'll keep doing our best. I agree with people. Uh, when you're dealing with uh, lazy and stupid people, then uh, you're just going to lose no matter what happens. Uh, uh, I actually uh, blogged uh, 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 this morning about uh, my experience on the ferry coming to Tasmania. And uh, they had a, a security sign that they didn't, me to they didn't allow me to read because they, they uh, it would have delayed the other cars. They forced me to get, drive past that reading the security sign about what I wasn't allowed to bring on the boat. Uh, then uh, having me unpack my car to actually let them search it, as, was, uh, as it was their job to do, would take too long, so they wouldn't let me to do that. So they just made me, uh, let me assure them that I wasn't doing anything naughty. Even though I didn't know what doing anything naughty was, I couldn't read the sign. And so I just went on the boat without uh, knowing about it. And uh, a final thing was um, they, uh, a problem that, that uh, is perhaps more easy or easier to address is that uh, they didn't explain uh, what the consequences were of the policy. And so one of the, the problems on the boat was um, you weren't allowed to have uh, gas cylinders in your car. And so if someone's uh, faced with the prospect of, of losing their gas cylinders that they paid for, they'd probably be inclined to say, no, I've got none of them, and just drive on and keep them hidden because uh, why do you want to lose your personal property? If, however, they had been told uh, your gas cylinders will be kept uh, in a safe place and returned to you at the end of the voyage, who would be more inclined to actually surrender them? And I think as, there are many examples of this situation where people unexplained, don't know the consequences of their actions and just hide things because they don't know what might happen to them if they're found doing something that might be a little bit naughty. And uh, these people problems just happen everywhere. And just that uh, transportation of ferries and uh, aeroplanes is the best examples nowadays, but it happens in security, computer security as well. Uh, in every corporation, you have people uh, breaking all the rules because it seems easy to do so, and there's no uh, easy way of uh, finding out what the, what the rules are what the consequences of the rules are, and uh, how to uh, obey them and do your job. So they just don't. Okay, so um, I, I think it's really good there's people like Bruce Snow who write books that everyday people or technical people at least can, can read and then um, <clears throat> learn things that weren't necessarily common knowledge. And I think a lot of, you know, a lot of what needs to happen is that technical people need to push back you know, and the company's back on managers and on the management and say, well, no, we really do need to do this properly because um, I've seen um, or heard of cases where, um, you know, you'll have something like a password rotation policy will be put in uh, because some accounting company has decided to become security experts and go around certifying people for Sarbanes-Oxley compliance and uh, tell them they need to have these password policies. And then if you go and look, the research shows that um, this password uh, rotation is, is that potentially less secure and that there's opinions that doing this actually violates Sarbanes-Oxley, you know, which is the sort of um, the, the data protection um, legislation in the US. So you know, you've got management often kind of cluelessly um, 
going through, jumping through hoops uh, just to basically cover their asses if they get sued or whatever. And but then you have hopefully use uh, technically knowledgeable people uh, at the coalface who can actually implement things. And in a, in a lot of ways, this is kind of the story of Linux because people with clues put Linux into companies all over the place without the management necessarily knowing. Uh, and similarly, uh, you would expect that with uh, people having knowledge of security. So I guess that's where the hope is. But um, there's some myths that are, I think work on a personal level as well. Like a lot of people just think, oh, well, this can't happen to me. And it's not a computer security issue. It's just a general thing. And um, what importance is that? Yeah, or the, you know, and also there's this sort of interesting area of uh, psychology where they uh, have observed this effect where people um, mis mis really miscalculate risk if it's negative versus positive. So people will um, underestimate negative risk and, and think, well, this is less likely to happen, something bad, and then they think that something that is very unlikely but positive is actually more likely. So. Um, they may not wear a helmet um, on a on a motorbike and then go out and buy a lottery ticket, and you know doing the same thing, you know driving down to the newsagent to buy a lottery ticket without a helmet on would be a classic case of this um, no understanding that if you fall off, you are fairly likely to hurt your head, but you're not going to win the lottery ticket. So there's some fundamental problems that are, are not really solvable in the computer arena at all. People. Um, people do have problems understanding the, the risks. And I think, so secure by default is important. And that's something I think if you look at all the distros, every distro now is much more secure by default uh, when you install it than it, it was. And I think every release in every distro. And so part of the aim of SE Linux, and in fact, a lot of the projects has been to um, have things enabled by default and have them try and have them work. And you know, you'll notice that you, know, you have SSH and I think now, if you install Fedora, there's no R commands like the, the previous commit. You have to manually install them, uh, this kind of thing. So, um, and this is an area where I think Linux does a lot better than, than most, most other. Common myths would be the point that a lot of users don't know when they're making security decisions. So there's a discrepancy between they're, they're really afraid of, of things that are fairly secure, but not scared about things they should be scared about. So some people will say, oh, I don't want to do internet banking. Um, but in reality, if it's set up properly, it's you know not too bad. But on the other hand, they'll download a game of Tetris. So I guess a part of the solution there is to let people know when they're making security decisions and what the consequences of those are. So if they're about to run a program, let them know that you know you're about to make a security decision. Um, if you know, and people are starting to be aware of what the little lock in the corner means when they're doing internet so banking. You like but UAC, beg your pardon. So you like UAC? <laughs> um, I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's a it's a good point. Okay, it annoys people, but by design, by design. <laughs> but people need to know when they're making security decisions. So, um, yeah, I think that's. Uh, I think security is a uh, so wide range term. So. Uh, people should know uh, this security module provides what kind of security. So, uh, what this security module protect it can protect. So, and security guides should uh, provide some information for user e user to uh, to understand what security module is for. All right. Well. Um, it's time for us to turn the stage over to the key exchange. So I'd like to thank the members of the panel. <laughs>